Good morning, comrades. Welcome to another episode of Misha TV. Misha TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not done that far yet, but uh, how you already did the introduction. Ice cold, that man. Ice cold. Well, another good morning, comrades. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Yaris. This time we're not going for a lap, although we are going for a round to circle around the area because the track is closed. But today, most importantly, I am joined by one and only Ice Cold Moritz Kranz. For Hi. the older audience, I'm pretty sure many of them are very excited to see you. And that's the reason also why we're making this video because many people have been asking throughout this year, where is Moritz? Why is he not driving taxi anymore? Where is Moritz? Well, I think Moritz has been doing pretty well for himself this year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no bad reason or something because sometimes people try to find some bad reasoning behind why certain things happen. There must be something wrong. There must be some drama. Well, oh, Lena says, let's switch that off because it's going <laughs> to annoy us throughout the whole video. Yep, now it's off. So, quick introduction to new audiences. Moritz is my pretty much, I would say not day one, but maybe like month one good friend towards the best friend ever since I came to the Nürburgring. So we go way back ever since I started doing my stuff here. He's been driving cars for a living, yeah. driving cars pretty fast, uh, driving cars it's, at some point also there were some talks about doing lap records for certain cars, companies, yeah. manufacturers, etc. Something that we're going to talk through today, answering also your questions that you were able to ask on Instagram and on YouTube. So in case you don't follow me yet on Instagram, check it out up here or just keep following me on YouTube for community. But anyhow, maybe a quick introduction for the new people. Who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> Why are you in this Hi. car? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Moritz. Um, yeah, what I basically do, I drive race cars for a living. Um, yeah, mostly or the last couple of years, I did mostly um, VLN and the 24 hour race. In the last four years, we won about 40 races, a couple of class wins in the N24 as well. So that was pretty good. And Pretty good. I like how hum humble this man is. The old audience knows that this guy is not driving one car, but two cars at the same time during the race. And in N24, 2018, I think, you drove also two cars? Both times, 18 Bo and 19. 18 and 19, both cars. So not one car, but two cars. So driving one car, hopping in into another, having a coffee then again two stints and then yeah maybe a nap of 30 minutes so yeah. how long did you sleep on average yeah i think you don't really sleep so yeah. I, at least i can't it's like you wake up saturday morning 7 a.m yeah and last time i went to bed sunday night at 10 p.m so it was from sunday saturday morning to sunday night yeah so like 36, 36 hours. Yeah, something like that. Up. Wow, machine. That's why we call him Ice Cold. So, and then? Uh, yeah, next to that, uh, I uh, also do a lot of stuff uh, racing-wise in the United States, in the IMSA series. That started, I believe, since 2019, roughly? Um, yeah, the first time I was racing in IMSA was 2017, but that was a one-off mm -hmm. in Road America. And yeah, last year it got a little more with coaching and the IMSA GT3 Cup Challenge. Mm -hmm. And this year, obviously, for known reasons, was a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Um, but still, I was man able to do like five events. And even the last race in Sebring, I was racing in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo. So I have a seat for the Lambo Super Trofeo next season in IMSA and also by the looks of it for the LMP3 challenge or the prototype challenge how it's called and um, yeah then coaching in IMSA so that's uh, three gigs in IMSA already mm -hmm. but by uh, coaching it's not the coaching that people usually use to off on my channel where you tell left curbs and right curbs yeah it? it's a little bit different so normally on Thursdays I, I drive the car work on the setup mm -hmm do some reference laps, some faster laps, so that when the, the actual driver is driving that we can compare on the on the Cosworth data. So the car has an uh, inboard data system, it's called Cosworth, so that we can compare his driving style compared to mine. And so we uh, analyze where the difference are and how he, uh, how he is able, to, how we can make him improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a little more more involving time yeah uh, time consuming consuming yeah so for for like a 30 minute session it takes like two hours sometimes to to 
have a proper mm -hmm. work around. I mean, you have a quick one that takes 10 minutes, da -da -da -da, you have to do this and this and this, but then you can go into like real deep data and it takes a lot of time. So you, sometimes you have to manage how much time should you invest in, in, the, in the analyzing. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very happy to hear that it's going very well for you, despite also this world situation that we see, especially yeah, that you're able to you. go to US and uh, race there and uh, do what you love. So again, this is the main reason why Moritz has not been with us on the channel or with Apex, because actually he was my neighbor living next door uh, in, the, in the same apartment building, you would say. Um, and that was easy, but then he moved to Cologne to, to a bigger city and like started racing in the United States. So it kind of didn't make sense logistically wise to just because he was not here anymore and he was busy everywhere else and doing very yeah. cool stuff. So that's in short the story of Moritz in general and to what he's been doing so far. So make sure to give him a follow, to subscribe, like and share, I don't know, share his profile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially if you're in the States. Um, go to one of the races to cheer for him whenever the spectating will be allowed but now let's go to the questions that people have asked uh, many of them were of course uh, regarding how to become a race car driver and especially well we covered it we actually made a video two years ago I believe where yeah. we went through it so I'll link it up in the video description or up here or was it here somewhere on top um, but uh, we said like of course you need to be a, a, uh, like you need to start young the best idea like it, it always in my opinion depends on what you want to do Ex that's if a very have, good point if you have the money you can be a racing driver anytime yes Bum. Uh, but if you want to be successful or maybe even become a pro driver you have to start at a young age mm -hmm. it's like playing soccer if you start at the age of 30 you will not make it to the national team mm -hmm. same with racing um, racing doesn't have a lot of common or it doesn't have it's you can't compare it with normal driving so everybody drives a car like yeah i can go racing now it's yeah. different and you learn that from a young age mm -hmm. and uh, yeah like i said it's the same as in soccer or football if you start at the age of 10 the chances getting to be to be a professional are high but if you start at the age of 30 no yeah yeah, exactly. You can still be doing racing, and that's what you see also, like from gentleman drivers. They just come, spend fifty thousand euro per year per race or twenty or whatever, and uh, they <laughs> depends on the car, obviously. Like yeah. a GT three car would be around twenty grand, I think, per race. It depends on which racing series. A racing obviously. series and racing team. If, yes. If it's like NLS, this in VLN that is a number that seems realistic. Yeah. Yeah, um, but of course, lower racing series, you can just pay a lot less. And I made also a video about explaining the racing costs. That's basically the same thing. You just come, you pay, you drive for fun, and you're still a racing driver, but you're not a paid racing driver. So the question is, what do you want to do? Do you want to become a contracted driver for Porsche, for Audi, for BMW? And BMW will not be racing anyway, <laughs> because they're like dropping out of every single motorsport series. But um, on a serious note, the question is what you want to do. But Let's talk about the torque of Yaris. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> quickly back on my side. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, just racing in general. Some people asked, what is the best way to, ra to be fast and safe in the rain? Since we're now in the to wet be, conditions. Yeah, <laughs> um, to be fast and safe in the rain. Um, slow feet, fast hands. Yeah. That means you have to be very have a good feeling on your, your throttle and the brake pedal, like a very slow application. And at the same time, you have to be very fast with your hands to catch the car mm -hmm. when it goes sideways. Um, and then it's track knowledge, especially when we talk about the Nordschleife. It's um, track knowledge is key to know where the rain line is. Mm -hmm. For example, on the Nordschleife, you do, you do have to do the rain line excessively. Mm -hmm. But then we had a race, and uh, it's actually the, uh, I think the picture you posted, uh, in Paul Ricard rain. Mm -hmm. And there the racing line had way more grip. So when it started to rain during the race, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do the rain line. I went on the rain line, and the car just, just yeah. went straight on. Okay. Okay. Then I went back on the racing line, okay, way more grip on the racing line. So um, in general, you have to, you know, need to know where you put your car in wet conditions and mm -hmm. then slow slow feet fast hands yeah 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to practice all that, uh, <laughs> a recurring question, what about sim racing? Um, Will it help you to gain like some certain hand movements? Yeah, or I think to, to, to work on reaction times and also to, to get understanding if you have a proper sim yeah. simulation and a proper wheel and everything to get feeling for how to catch a car, when to open up the steering or to, to overcorrect and all that stuff. That can help also like track knowledge and that stuff. Even working on, on setups sometimes because for example in iRacing as far as I'm concerned the, the changes you make in iRacing they are this more or less the same you would do in a race a real race car. Obviously the figures or the numbers are different mm -hmm. but if you if you close the toe in the back it's gonna have the same effect on iRacing than in a, in a real car. Mm -hmm. So, so um, Simulation can help, but uh, it, obviously it's not comparable in the end yeah, when you're so, racing. So you need to be the real thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, fact, uh, fear or not to say fear, but um, the to perception have respect of speed. and all that stuff. It's different. And in a simulator, you just go, and in a real race car, mm -hmm. if you go off at 230, you're like, ah, not that cool. And um, that's something you. Also, you start learning from a young age to accept certain risks and dangers that people that are older mm -hmm. may not be willing to take. Yeah, yeah. So, do you think that uh, drivers become slow as they become older because of that? And especially, would that be one of the things what why you should get into racing sooner? Because you sometimes see, uh, like. Uh, my best example would be like when I was doing like sort of scooter cross motocross you would have at the beginning race there would be like five-year-old kids on, on, on scooter cross or, or like on the on, on mopeds and yeah. they would drive faster and jump higher than the adults would because they just have no perception of fear everyone's saying like oh my god and in the first corner like 10 of them like fall over and like ah, and then they don't care they just get on and drive on again because again it's just like something kids they have no perception of fear yeah um it's it's at I think at a certain age you will just get slower yeah because yeah. your reaction times go down mm -hmm. and um, maybe even you start you're not willing to take high risks I mean uh, if I compare myself to I had some young co drivers in the LMP car this year mm -hmm. and this guy was taking risks that I was not willing to take because I know if I take this risk straight away and it goes wrong yeah I have a big accident and the car's done yeah he got lucky uh, he went off at like 240 in Le Mans didn't hit anything you can do it like once in a lifetime and um, later we were we were doing the same lap times it's just like the understanding when do you take certain risks mm -hmm. when it is is it necessary um, so at a young age you always go always push 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 the older you get, you start to, to use your head sometimes a little bit more to, to know when is it, when should I take risk and when should I not take any risk because it's just uh, not necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go back to the LMP3 racing that yes. you got into. What's the biggest difference in comparison to the previous cars you drove? Um, so obviously I never raced GT3, I raced GT3 Cup and GT4. And um, the biggest difference is the, the aerodynamic, I would say. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you say a certain corner, you can do with the GT4 190, the GT3 Cup 200. With the GT, uh, with the LMP3, you do it like 245. Wow. Something like that. So the, the um, you need to, to understand how the aerodynamic works and to trust it. And I think that's the, a big difference. Yeah. You said also the amount of physique required to yes. drive the car. Yes, so I can, I can do three hours in the GT3 Cup and VLN at 35 degree outside temperature, no problem. But 45 minutes in the LMP3, it wasn't, it wasn't as physical. It was just, for example, the neck and shoulders mm -hmm. get punished way more because of the higher G-forces. So I had to adapt my, my training to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so many questions were also related to physique. 
how yes. do you prepare yourself? To, uh, like, first of all, how important is physique and being a race car driver? Because some people, is not you guys, but some people say like, uh, oh, my grandma can drive. So what's the difficult about driving a race car? So how is that a race sport? So how important is physique and how do, how should people prepare themselves to it? What are the most important things? And what can you say something about your preparation schedule? Um, yeah, it's, it's as important as the talent in the end because um, as when you start going down in terms of performance, uh, in terms of performance, but you get tired in the car, mm -hmm. you start losing your, your concentration, you start making small mistakes, you start losing lap times, and ultimately you might even crash mm -hmm. because you just your head is not there anymore. So it's very important to, to, to be physically fit, to mm -hmm. do a lot of training. And um, yeah, so I do a lot of uh, cycling and running. Mm -hmm. What Dur is a lot? During the first lockdown, for example, I was doing like a thousand kilometers on the bike a month. Okay. With like 100, 200 kilometer rides. Mm -hmm. uh, then obviously as the... Um, yeah, as the season started, there was not that much time, especially when the ra traveling with the United States came in. Mm -hmm. So then you keep running three, four times a week. Um, How long, on average? Yeah, it's maybe an hour maximum. That's mm -hmm. enough for for what what I'm doing, and I'm not racing Formula One or LMP One, or so. It's like one hour is enough. Yeah, because you also have to do uh, other stuff. You have to to do it like. Uh, core training for your for your upper body you have to do neck training shoulder training mm -hmm. uh, also your arms basically the whole body um, to, to be yeah prepared for the racing mm -hmm. yeah so uh, and going back to LMP3 there was like a, one of the highest ranked comments or questions was uh, how noticeable is the effect of dirty air when you follow another car Massive. Uh, for so example, dirty air. This means because, as mentioned, LMP3 cars are very aerodynamic sensitive, so they work on downforce, and you need to have air. That's how aerodynamics work. And if you're following another car, this uses all the air, and then you don't have the actual well, clean air or the fixed air, and you have well less or well less downforce in this case. Yeah. So um, for example, when we were racing in Le Mans, so we had like uh, we were racing in Le Mans as well as um, a support race for the 24 hour mm -hmm. and then you at the end of the t of the lap you have the Porsche corners and I was quite close behind another car mm -hmm. and when I got to like if you were like 30 meters 20 meters you could feel a little bit of push not mm -hmm. much just a little bit and this guy was on an in lap whatever and I got really close like within 10 or 5 meters mm -hmm. And it actually felt like the front started to take off. I know the front will not take off, but there was basically no downfalls anymore and the car just went straight. Yeah. Um, so when we were racing in the last race of the season, I was fighting the, my whole stint with another car. And in fast corners, I was just not basically going half a meter left or right or a meter offline yeah. to catch some clean air to mm -hmm. be able to go through fast corners without suffering from too much understeer. Wow, so going offline is better by having to, good air in this case. For me, it felt like that to a certain mm. extent. Obviously, it's the first year for me racing a high downforce car. And um, yeah, but for me, when I was on the racing line, you could feel you were suffering from understeer. You were still making a corner, mm -hmm. but you had a lot of steering input and a lot of scrubbing on a tire, eating up the front tire. So it's made more sense to um, be a little offline mm -hmm. so to have uh, less tire scrubbing to save the tires a little bit mm. yeah yeah uh, what else did we have oh, yeah what's your nastiest uh, moment <laughs> <laughs> my nastiest moment um, that was actually uh, on the Nordschleife mm -hmm. 2016 um, Coming towards Schwedenkreuz, <laughs> notorious Schwedenkreuz, and uh, turning in, uh, going into the corner or apexing the corner mm -hmm. at 230 with a GT4 car. Mm -hmm. 
and that was just too much for the car. So the car got sideways, got a tank slapper, went off, nearly connected the, in, the, the right hand side wall, spun backwards, back across the track, to the right, uh, basically um, straight again into the gravel. Didn't hit anything. Uh, that was, yeah, at the first moment you think, okay, that's like a write off. You mm -hmm. total the car now. But I was uh, somehow managed not to, to uh, crash the car. And um, that's the situation we need to learn from it. So later I looked at the data and realized when I'm five or six kph slow at that corner, it doesn't make any difference in lap time. So ever since then, I know I can do, with the new GT4, you can do like 235. I do 228. With the GT4, uh, GT3 Cup, you can do maybe 240. I do 235. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't make any difference in lap time, especially in the Nordschleife. I just have that little yeah. safety margin at that point yeah, to finish first you have to finish first yeah and it's just again if you go off at 235 at train kreuz and i mean you all got you everybody has seen the the crashes and tf where the cars roll like seven times and yeah and they crash at like 180 or 170. yeah yeah i don't want to go off there at 235 and hit the guardrail head on because that's gonna be uh Unhealthy Make, makes sense. Unhealthy is a good way. And it of, doesn't uh, doesn't. Sometimes you have to take risks where you're just like, okay, I might get hurt if I do that, but it's necessary for racing. Mm -hmm. But if it's not necessary, then especially in the Nordsch life, you have to think twice. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah. What's your favorite track? <sighs> of of course, Nordsch life is one of my favorite tracks. Um, that's good because many people ask what's your favorite track outside the Nordschleife. <laughs> ah, okay, outside the Nordschleife. Ah, okay. Um, I, I really love um, Road Atlanta. Okay. That's a nice track, Road America. I mean, basically, nearly all of the United States tracks. Okay. Because um, they are just pure, you know? That's not like a FIA uh, Formula One prepared track. You have a little bit of one-off, then you have a concrete wall, it goes up and down, high curbs, low curbs, and you don't have that anymore here in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I read one of the questions that was like Portimao, about Portimao, and Portimao yeah. is an awesome track, you should go there. It's, <laughs> it's a fun track, and um, it comes a little bit close to some of the US tracks, obviously more one-off area, mm -hmm. but it goes up and down, and um, that's, a, that's a really nice track. Mm. What's more satisfying, driving a good race or driving a good race car, or actually, which means, uh, in other words, having an easy win or having a fight for every position? In the end, it's having a good, uh, good race or result, mm -hmm. because I, I don't care if I'm being, in the end, if I finish up fifth or whatever, and the car was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> doesn't help me. So I'd rather have a, a good result than uh, a good race car. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it goes hand in hand most of the times. Um, and winning is always fun. Yeah. So I take the win over the fighting. Mm -hmm. But if I can't win, I at least want to have <laughs> some action going on on track. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's your biggest accomplishment to date? That's, that's a question where I, uh, I really have a hard time answering, to be honest, because what is for me, I'm asking what is a big accomplishment? <laughs> uh, maybe we won the, uh, our, our class in the, um, in the N24 last year, in 2019, mm -hmm. and we were P14 overall and best non-GT3 car. Yeah. So that's something where I'm like, okay, that's 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 a good result and then certain laps in the, in the rain where I was P12 with the GT4 after qualifying in front of some GT3 cars mm -hmm. and way ahead of everything else that is called GT4 and NLS because in NLS you have like GT4 and SP8, SP10 and whatever mm -hmm. so you have like a lot of different GT4 cars in different classes with different uh, levels of performance mm -hmm. but we were way ahead in the rain and those are those things go unnoticed most of the times but for me personally that's uh, very satisfying yeah. mm. 
yeah I can relate to that definitely like when he was racing we were always cheering like oh my god look at words <laughs> he's like close to top 10 among everyone else like above the GT3 cars that was like very fun to watch I hope that and speaking of which I hope to be able to witness it again this year you didn't drive much NLS slash VLN yeah what are the plans for next year um yeah at the moment it looks like I will be doing a lot of stuff in IMSA as I said before at the introduction of the video I'm gonna do a IMSA Lamborghini Super Trofeo mm -hmm. I'm gonna do uh, IMSA prototype challenge with the LMP3. Mm -hmm. By the looks of it, as of today, I'm gonna do Daytona 24 in the LMP3. I mm -hmm. might do Sebring 12 hours in the LMP3. So you're moving to the States, basically? No. No? <laughs> no. I'm gonna, I, I like it, Germany. <laughs> but will it not be cheaper to stay there more than here? No. No? I think. Uh, no, because you're like all over states, you're not just like yeah, like that's never cring you with yeah, the, so you still have to fly to yeah, yeah um, makes sense and um, yeah next to that uh, I'm talking to different teams about racing and Michelin Le Mans Cup as well in the LMP3 car mm -hmm. um, European Le Mans series I don't know mm -hmm. I have to see I mean the good thing is I'm a pros rated driver so. Um, that's a big advantage for me right now in my in this part of the state of my career mm -hmm. um, yeah and NLS I don't know so there's a lot of clashes with other with the with the IMSA races so I think I could do the N24 mm -hmm. and like three races or four races of NLS mm -hmm. but um, that's about it then yeah yeah, yeah. Just going through some questions. Let's throw in a funny one. Funny ones. Do, do you like goulash? It's okay. I don't eat too much meat, to be honest. Yeah, let's talk about the race car diet. Race diet. car driver <laughs> diet. What do you eat? <laughs> what I'm eating? Um, carpaccio. Yeah, carpaccio. Always for a starter, I know that. <laughs> uh, as a starter, I often eat carpaccio. But as I said before, I'm trying to get away from meat a little bit. Like Why? Beef. Um, except for carpaccio, I, I like the taste of it. <laughs> Other than that, I don't. It doesn't give me. It's not. Um, it doesn't give me too much, to be honest. I, if I, I rather eat like a good pasta mm -hmm. or a pizza than a steak. Yeah. So it tastes better for me. So, and um, sometimes, if you sometimes see how the okay now it gets political, how the, the animals are treated, I don't like that. So I don't support that too much. Okay. It's, it's, it's funny because like uh, uh, actually Mate Rimats from Rim, uh, Rimats Automobili, he, he's also vegetarian but not uh, because of uh, he doesn't like meat or doesn't that, it's mostly because the whole political stuff around it, how animals are treated. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I like animals a lot. Yeah. Obviously, I would never have a cow in my, in my own yard garden or whatever but uh, yeah, yeah. I, that, it's not necessary to treat animals like that and also how they uh, contribute to the the whole environment like the, yeah. the, the war, warming up yeah that's na I mean obviously that's also a little bit a part of that but um, I mean if I'm in racing it's yeah a little bit hypocritical is that the right word <laughs> uh, uh, hypocritical yeah, yeah. That's what I'm, to talk about environmental impacts on but yeah it, it, yeah, it obviously plays a part. Uh, I, I try to drive as less with a car in private as possible. But okay, my job is driving cars and when I need to fly to do mm -hmm. that, then I do that. But in, in private life, I mean in Cologne, you can use, I use public transport or sometimes we just walk the five, six kilometers into the city, mm -hmm. eat and then we walk back. So we don't even use the car. So, yeah. 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 Okay, let's go back to the topic so far. Yeah. <laughs> Driving. Politics is always difficult, huh? <laughs> yeah, they do, do be less... Um, hmm. What else? Uh, yeah, maybe something else. Um, the best tip to become a better driver, just like for people who just get into track driving and like track day driving, TF driving. Um, get advice. Um, I mean, if, you are, if you're uh, serious, get a coach. Mm -hmm. If you just get advice from different people you get different advices and some make sense some doesn't make sense some doesn't make any sense and maybe they even uh, say different stuff do person A says do stuff A and person B says do stuff B whatever so 
it doesn't bring you so if you're serious get a coach other than that always what I'm doing I rewatch my footage see what could have been better and try to learn from from what I'm doing mm -hmm. even if I didn't make any mistakes I just watch it to see and be uh, open-minded about being not the best driver and try to to improve yeah. yeah so actually the preparation for the race takes more time than actually racing and also post everything what's happening around it takes more time than actually uh yeah that's where you get the most success maybe um yeah so in the end you always do a track walk you watch onboard footages and all that stuff mm -hmm. um and it helps you but it helps you maybe in the first 10 15 laps and after that people that are not prepared but on the same let's say level of talent mm -hmm. driving skill and so on it's basically evens out um, yeah but if you do it continuously preparation and briefings debriefings on all that stuff then sooner or later you will get the edge on the people that don't mm -hmm. yeah. your favorite ice cream my favorite ice cream oh. <laughs> chocolate chocolate <laughs> Shock a lot. Shock a lot, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, we've been pretty much through all the all the questions. Uh, <laughs> are you also gonna buy GRRs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm a bit boring about that, but uh, my private car is an Opel Corsa. I think in the UK it's called Foxhall Corsa. Yeah. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm happy with my car, it's a cheap car to run and I'm lucky that I can uh, drive fast cars all the time so I don't need to have a, yeah. uh, a fast car. Are you colder than Kimi? <laughs> Nobody's colder than Kimi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool, uh, yeah, very good responses. We're approaching, we're coming back to Apex and I also recording limit on my GoPro because I inserted a small memory card for so for once it's not going to be an hour long video but maybe just half an hour long um so any final thoughts that you would like to share merry christmas <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good and a happy new year and the happy that 2021 is better than 2020 absolutely that's a very very good one so thank you very much for your time my pleasure for Thanks. this uh lap around the Nürburgring, like pretty big lap Hope you guys enjoyed as well the, the different setting than just sitting in a barn and drinking because currently it's uh, i mean it's five o'clock somewhere in the world so we, we could <laughs> technically do it <laughs> uh but i have yet to see more as drink i think at the end of the season sometimes you you do you take a glass don't talk about it <laughs> last year was bad <laughs> bye bye <laughs> thanks for watching give him a follow and uh, looking forward to see him race uh here at the Nürburgring when in this case a lot more in the states so if you're in the states hopefully spectators will be allowed and uh, say hello oh we have mail maybe something for me we got mail we got mail time yeah. okay thank you bye bye